Okay, so here's the first sentence. Let's listen to the recording. 先週の日曜日、私の息子の小学校で運動会がありました。Okay, so what this means is that last week, Sunday, I, Sun Elementary School, connected by No, this is、uh, basically my son's elementary school. And then this is exercise meeting. So it, together it means a, a sports festival, a sports meet. And then arimashita, so was. This is our verb. So at the macro level, what we have here is we have a clause ending with the verb aru in the formal past tense form, mashita. And the structure of a Japanese clause is that you have, before the verb at the end, you have any number of noun phrases, each of which is marked by a particle that denotes its function in the clause. So here we have a noun phrase marked by the particle de, and here we have a noun phrase marked by the particle ga.、Um, here, actually, this is an, a time expression used adverbially, and so it doesn't need a particle. So that's the exception, is adverbs don't have to be marked by particles. Sometimes you'll see them marked by ni at the end.、Um, but In many cases, that's not a requirement.、Uh, the adverbs are also interesting. I'll throw this out here right now. Adverbs are interesting in that, li like in English, they can basically go anywhere in the clause. And, and it doesn't, logically, the interpretation doesn't really change based on where you put the adverb. It might change the emphasis, it might change the feel of the sentence, but it doesn't strictly matter where you put it. I mean, you, you can't insert it recklessly in the middle of things. Like, you, you know, here you wouldn't break up, like between Matashi and Mosko, you wouldn't, like, stick it in between that. That, of course, would. Uh, break the syntax. But you could, for example, put it after de. You could insert it like here between these two noun phrases marked by particles. Okay. So that's the basic、uh, Japanese clause structure is verb at the end, any number of noun phrases marked by particles, and then adverbs, they can kind of float around, though very typically they will come at the beginning. And also note that、um, the noun phrases, there's not really a set order to which sorts of particle. Which noun phrase is marked by which particles come before others? You could also express this clause by flipping the order of the de noun and the ga noun. You could, you could flip them around. And the literal sense of the sentence, I don't think, would be any different.、Uh, again, it might change the feel, it might change the emphasis.、Um, and, and what in this specific case that change of emphasis or feel might be, I, I can't really say now, but、um, grammatically, they're both equally valid. There definitely are tendencies of what elements of a clause tend to come before others, but Uh, as far as I know, aside from the verb coming at the end, there's not really a strict rule about the order. Okay, so the question is well, what are these noun phrases first? So we have here,、um, for, well, first the adverb phrase. So last week, Sunday. So the no particle has a couple primary uses, but one is as a connective particle that connects nouns together, or, or more accurately, I'd say it. Marks the thing before it as a modifier. So, senshu by itself just means last week, but this is last week, Sunday.、Uh, or in English, you could translate this as、uh, Sunday of last week or last week's Sunday.、Um, though I guess you could also say you could say last week's Sunday, and that also is a valid phrase in English. So, that, that's one thing to note about no, is that in English, we have a few different ways of expressing the same idea of, of taking nouns and making them into modifiers. We have the possessive s, which has a sense of like, Well, possession.、Um, but then we have of, we can connect things with of, but that's kind of strange because in that case you flip the order. And then the, the third thing we do, we just, you know, to turn a noun into modifier, you just stick it in front of another noun. You just use it as, as if it were like an adjective. In, in Japanese, however, they basically just have this one option, the no connecting particle. Now, here we have a case of three nouns connected by no. And the understand about such cases is that how you group the elements. Can change the interpretation. Well, the, the natural interpretation in this case is that you group this as a unit because my son, that's obviously a kind of thing.、Um, whereas alternatively, if you grouped this first, you would have a son elementary school and you'd be saying, well, it's my son elementary school, whatever son elementary school is. It's an elementary school full of sons, I suppose. Understand that、um, which, how, how to group these elements, whether it's first my son and then it's my son's elementary school or whether it's There's an elementary school of sons, and it's my elementary school of sons.、Um, which of these is the proper interpretation can't be decided by the grammar. The grammar is perfectly ambiguous. Like both are equally grammatically valid interpretations. Of course, logically and, and through context,、um, 
obviously the the idea of my son's elementary school is by far the much more obvious interpretation and, and clearly what's intended here. But grammatically understand, it is ambiguous. So maybe this is not the best example because it is very clear what the intended interpretation is. But you do have other cases of three or more nouns connected by null where how the elements should be grouped isn't as obvious and, and seems more ambiguous. In English, of course, what we can do is we will, when we have these kinds of ambiguities, we can, in writing at least, sort of disambiguate with, with hyphens in some cases or sometimes use commas. In Japanese, that's not really an option, though. So the last question here is, what is the significance of these particles? The day particle, I would sum up as saying that it denotes the, the bounds of action or the bounds of location. And that can be both uh, physical, literal, or more metaphorical. In this case, it's very literal. There's a location, which is my son's elementary school, and that is the bounds of the action, where the action is taking place. In other cases, though, I'd say the sense of bounds is more abstract. It's not necessarily so literal. The ga particle, well, this is usually described as being the subject particle. It marks the subject of the clause. And here, that's definitely a fair interpretation. We have the sports meet, the sports festival, and that is the thing which exists or did exist last Sunday. However, you will find other cases, particularly with certain verb forms, where the thing marked by ga is not the subject as we think of it in English. In English, the subject is the thing which does the action of the clause or the thing being ascribed a, a quality and attribute in the case of verbs like is, so-called linking verbs. In Japanese, however, there are counterexamples where that's quite clearly not the case. Anyway, so that's something we'll have to uh, watch out for. I can't fully explain it right now. I just want to throw out that, that warning. So now the next sentence, let's listen. 運動会はスポーツのイベントです。So in this case, we have a clause that ends not in a verb, but what's called the copula, the formal form of the copula, this. And the concept of a copula is that it links a thing with another thing or with a quality. So in this case, we have, well, as I'll get into, the topic of the sentence, the sports festival, and it's being linked to, equated with a sport event. It is a sport event. In English, our copula is, well, we have a, a few of them, primarily, though, the verb to be. So, um, a is B, links A and B together. In Japanese, though, they have this distinct thing called the copula, which I, I think primarily because it doesn't follow the conjugation patterns of, of the verbs, is considered its own separate thing. But anyway, that's another option of how you end your clause, either with the verb or the copula, or the third option, as we'll see maybe in some later example sentence, with a so-called E adjective. Those are the three ways you end a clause. The other thing to note in the sentence here is that we have a sports festival marked by the particle wa, which strangely is written actually with the character ha, and yet as a special case pronounced wa for this particle. And what the wa particle does is it marks the so-called topic of the sentence. So strictly speaking, undokai is not the subject of the sentence, it's the topic. What's the distinction? Well, this is a perennial mystery of basic Japanese grammar. It's one of the very first hurdles of Japanese grammar, and it's something which no source I've found has been able to properly explain. The most broad interpretation of topic is that it's something connected to the clause in some broad, undefined way. It, it is something that is being raised in relation to the clause, but its function in the clause is not really explicitly stated. It's left open to interpretation. So the way a topic is commonly translated in, in, into English is you would say here, as for a sports festival, it is a sport event. Now, it's, in this particular case, it's very obvious that the topic, its function is to basically stand in as the subject. We don't have an explicit subject marked by God like we did in the previous sentence. And so in this case, this is implicitly the subject of the sentence. It is a thing being ascribed to quality by the copula. It is the thing which is a sport event. And it's true a large majority of the time when you do see the, a topic in a sentence, when you do see wa, well, it is standing in for the subject. That is very, very common. However, there are counterexamples. In some cases, it could be actually implicitly an object of the clause. It could be something affected by the verb rather than the agent of action itself. So this is one area where Japanese embraces ambiguity, or, or perhaps you would say lack of specificity uh, relative to, to English and, and most other languages. 
anyway, this is something I can't really give you a full account of right now, partly because I don't fully understand myself, and partly because it's the sort of thing you just have to see used over and over again to get a sense of, of how it's properly used. And so what this means is that、um, everyone at the elementary school, that's our subject, and then schoolyard,、uh, that's the location. And what are we doing? We're running, hashittari and odottari, dancing. We're running, dancing, among other things. So the interesting thing here is it's using this pattern where you use the so called tari form. It's like the, the past tense with ri stuck on at the end. And you, you list, inexhaustively list the actions that take place, and you end with a form of suru, which in this case is the formal form of, of suru. So,、um, honestly, I don't really understand this form fully. I don't know many, I've not really seen many variants of it.、Um, but it is a construction to list, inexhaustively list actions. Okay, so the subject here, the thing marked by got, is again, yes, the everyone at the elementary school, or possibly maybe you would interpret this as. Everyone related to the elementary school, everyone like the, the students, the teachers, the, the parents. I'm not sure which is the better interpretation. Maybe are, both are equally valid. And then here, this is interesting because, well, this is a noun phrase and here's a separate noun phrase. And what's going on here is a phenomenon which we have in English as well called apposition, where you just throw out a noun phrase and then immediately after you follow with another noun phrase to restate it, to, to rephrase the noun. Uh, so, for example, in English, you can say, like,、um, my uncle loves pizza. And then you can say, well, my uncle, comma, the, the famous football player, comma, loves pizza. So, in English, in, in punctuation, in writing, you would, you would surround it in commas. And you're just basically restating the noun in a different way. And that's what's happening here. Is she's, she says, kote,、uh, meaning schoolyard, playground, and then explaining what that is in another way, saying, well, the, 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 the yard of the school. Uh, and so, in writing here, they're using a comma to separate. Japanese is quite loose about commas. There's no, I don't think there's any hard rules about comma usage, but it makes sense here to, to separate out these two noun phrases. Otherwise, it, in writing, it'd be kind of ambiguous. It would look like one big long word written in kanji.、Uh, lastly, here,、uh, there's again the question of okay, well, why ga instead of wa? In the prior sentence, we used wa, now we're using ga. One is the topic, one is the subject. Could you use wa in this case? Yes, you definitely could. That would change the feel of it, the sense of it, slightly in, in some subtle way. How exactly, though, I'm not really prepared to say it. Again, the wa versus ga business is infamously tricky.、Um, at most, I would say that expressing something as a topic rather than explicitly as a subject has a sense of, a bit more of a sense of like, oh, by the way. So, like, incidentally, here's something to say about this, this topic. Whereas using ga is more. Uh, has a bit of a feel of being more emphatic, more direct. Next sentence. Corona no mai made, undo kai wa totemo oki evento de shita. So this is saying before Corona, the sports event,、uh, very big event was. So it was a very big event before Corona. So, here at the end, we have the polite past tense form of the copula. Something is an event, and it's an event that is big, very big.、Uh, here again, we have a topic which implicitly is acting as the subject. It is the thing which is an event. It is a very large event. And the time expression here is marked by made, which denotes the extent of something, the limit up to, is maybe the best translation. So, up to before Corona is. Probably the best translation here.、Um, I think you'd, you, you would get away by just saying,、uh, you, you would drop the made entirely and just have this as your time expression. That would work. Again, noun phrases that are time expressions can be used adverbially without any explicit marking to make them adverbs. I think alternatively, you can, instead of made, you could put ni here, and that would mark the time expression as being explicitly adverbial. I think that also would be valid, though arguably it changes the sense a little bit because the, the, the made here. Is emphasizing the part where up to a moment in time, before, before Corona, up to a moment in time, it was the case that the event was very big. Asa, Hachi, Kurai, Kara, Yugata, Made, 
運動会をやっていました。Okay, so this is saying that、uh, morning, eight o'clock, kurai kurai, about, about eight o'clock in the morning, kara from, so from about eight o'clock in the morning, and then yugata made, so evening, up to, up to evening,、uh, undokai, so the sports festival again, this is now our direct object, marked by the particle wo, direct object, the thing directly affected by the action. And what is the action here? Well, it's, um, yotte i m a s h i t a So this is, uh, Yaru, a verb meaning basically do, but having more of a sense of undertake, perform. I think it was more of a sense of like an ongoing action, perhaps, compared to suru. I, I really can't fully explain it. Anyway,、uh, and this is the, the form of the verb here is the teiru form. So the teiru form, well, depending upon the nature of the action, might have a sense of ongoing action, continuous action. In other cases, depending upon what the verb means exactly, it has, has more of a sense of, well, the action took place and then that the resulting state persisted. That's more appropriate for other verbs. It, it, it really is actually very contextual in what the verb is and, and the, the other context.、Uh, so it's a mistake to think of it too directly as an equivalent of the English progressive tense. I, I think that's kind of a mistake. Anyway, so this is the, the teiru form, but it's、uh, polite past tense. So, te i m a s h i t a So, what the whole sentence is saying is that. Uh, it th- was doing the sports festival from about eight o'clock in the morning up to the evening.、Uh, one last thing to note here is the word gurai,、uh, meaning about. It's, it's, it's technically a particle, actually, used as a suffix on a noun to, to mean like about such and such, about eight o'clock.、Uh, if you notice, she actually pronounced it kurai, not gurai. Because apparently, for no rhyme or reason that I can discern, sometimes this word is pronounced gurai, sometimes gurai. I don't know if there's any tendencies or patterns or anything to do with dialect or, or whatever. As far as I can tell, native Japanese speakers just kind of randomly alternate between the two. Ryoshin ya oji chan oba chan ga undokai o mini ikimasu. So, this is saying, d o s h i n meaning parents or, or technically both parents, and o j i c h a n grandparent,、uh, sorry, grandfather, and o b a c h a n grandmother. What are they doing? Well, the action is ikimas, formal of iku, going, go. And what are they going? They're going to see. So, this is actually the, the so called masu stem of miru. You drop the ru and you just get mi, and you suffix it with ni, and one. One sense of me is it like marks a, a target. In this case, I would say like the target action, the target thing to do. So we are going to see is the sense of this. And we are going to see what? We're going to see the, the direct object here, the thing being seen is the sports festival. Honestly, I'm a little unclear on why this construction is used. There are a couple other ways of expressing the idea of doing one action to do another. I don't know why you would pick this one in this case. Uh, anyway, so this is a kind of complicated topic.、Uh, the other interesting thing going on here is so we have this inexhaustive list. We, we have uh, parents, uh, grandfathers, grandmothers. That's our subject. Notice that the first two things are connected by ya. Ya is like a connective particle、uh, for an inexhaustive list, a list where there's possibly other things that might be included as well. We just didn't mention them. But notice the second and third items in the list, they're not separated by ya. I'm quite sure they could be. I think it'd be totally valid to stick y'all here, but it seems to be a case like in English where if you have a list, the rule is you have to put and between the last two elements of the list. I think it's the reverse in Japanese. You have to put it between the first two, and otherwise it's optional between the remaining elements. I believe that's effectively the rule, though I'm not really certain. So, the kids and kids. みんな一緒に昼ごはんを食べます。Okay, so here this is saying basically sore de is a combination of sore, meaning that and de, the particle, and you stick them together just as a sense of. It's, it's one of many expressions you can use to just lead into a new statement.、Uh, here the translation is given, so therefore, etc. And then it's saying、uh, kodomo, children, toka, meaning like for example, so you're marking like an example case with toka. Um, families, kazoku, toko. And then what about them? Well, mina、uh, ishoni. So this is an adverbial form of 
meaning together. So everyone together, what are they doing? They are uh, eating lunch. Now, the this particle toka, which is, well, it's a combo particle, to, the, the so-called quoting particle, which I'm sure we'll encounter later and we can talk about then, but also ka, which is uh, sometimes called the question particle. I would say it marks something that's hypothetical, something that's a possibility, but not necessarily known to be true. Um, and so you put them together and you get something, you, you get a combo particle that marks an example case. So again, children and families are an example case. The question is what grammatical function, like how does it fit into the rest of the clause? What purpose does it serve in the clause? An example case of what? A subject, an object of what? Well, one possibility here, I don't know if this is true. It's interesting to me that this directly precedes minna. So I wonder if the significance is that, you know, we're describing example cases of what composed, what, what mina is composed of. That might be what's going on here, though I honestly really don't know. So what this is saying is that uh, early morn uh, morning, early uh, waking up, uh, bento box, bento lunch, making uh, uh, slightly troublesome was. So waking up and making a bento box was slightly troublesome. Working backwards, this, this whole clause ends in the polite past form of the copula, so something was, and what was it? It was taihen, it was troublesome, slightly troublesome, chotto, that's an adverb. And then we have here our topic, marked by wa, and all of this technically is, this is all technically a noun phrase. It's a noun phrase that consists of uh, a nominalized subclause. So in fact, this is the other major use of no. We saw it to connect, uh, to, to turn nouns into modifiers, basically, to connect nouns. But here what's happening is it immediately precedes a, a subclause. Here, here's just like the normal Japanese clause construction ending in a verb. And this juxtaposition of verb before no tells you that you're looking at a nominalized uh, an unnominalized clause. So when we do this, this has the sense of that this clause says make a bento box, but the no here basically turns it into a noun, turns it into the act of making a bento box. Okay, and the other interesting thing here is that we have basically a linked clause. We have two clauses linked together with the conjunctive form, the te form. So it's like we did this, we you know wake up early in the morning and make a bento box. Those two things are linked. The, the, the pattern is that you have any number of clauses that link together and the rule is that all the clauses end in the te form of the verb, except the last one, which ends in a normal form of the verb, in this case, the non-past uh, informal form of the verb. So what does linking clauses imply is an interesting question. Well, in the simplest case, you're just saying two unrelated things. Just like in English, if you say, A, I did this and I did that, and there's no necessary relationship between them. It, it, that, that could be an interpretation of what this is saying. It's like, well, I woke up and then I also made a, a bento box. But very often it implies a sense of, of sequence where A occurs before B. So I wake up, woke up first and then made the bento box might be the implication here. Uh, sometimes there's a, a sense of causality of like, well, I did the first thing and that caused the second thing. This is another area of Japanese where it heavily leans on just contextual inference. And so grammatically, like the, how this is to be interpreted really largely depends on logic and context. In this case, I would say this is, it just has a sense of sequence. So it's like, well, I woke up first and then I made the bento box. Now, actually, I believe there's, there's one more grammatical ambiguity here. And that is conceivably the interpretation, the grammatical interpretation would be that this is a linked clause that links not with this subclause, but with the whole macro level, top level clause. Arguably, it doesn't make quite as much sense because you're saying, uh, wake up early morning and after waking up, well, what did you do? Well, you had trouble making a bento box. Um, so I, I, I mean, I guess that still kind of makes sense. That still kind of works. My guess though, my gut feeling is that just by, just by virtue of you hear this first. And so this naturally, I think it's more natural to interpret this as being one big linked clause that is nominalized. So this is another issue of like ambiguous grouping. I mean, English has these problems as, as well. Don't get me wrong. Like there are cases in English where uh, say like uh, some straight prepositional phrase, it's not clear if it belongs to one clause or some subclause thereof, like, and you get some ambiguities uh, that arise out of that. So no, no natural language, no human language is free of ambiguities. Culturally and, and linguistically, Jap Japanese is just more tolerant of such ambiguity. 
うちでは夫がおにぎりを作って私が唐揚げとか卵焼きを作っていました。Okay, so this is saying、um, home at home husband、uh, おにぎり rice ball make and then I、uh, deep fried food I think maybe specifically deep fried chicken but or maybe just in this case deep fried food in general、uh, toka for example and then fried egg or rolled omelet maybe、um, make or rather made past tense t e y a r u past tense okay so at home my husband made rice、uh, balls and I made fried food and fried eggs I think is the sense of this So, grammatically, the interesting thing going on here is well, first, we have a combo particle of de and wa together. So, it's this is, in some cases, when you combine two particles together, they form like a, a new sense. They're not really the sum of their constituent parts. But in this case, it's really just uchi might as well be marked by de or wa. Like either would work. And so, we're just using both. It's the location of action and also it's sort of our topic because it's what we're talking about. It's like, well, at home, as by, by the way, at home,、uh, my husband made rice balls. So, that's why it's de wa here. So, there's another case where we now have the, the linking with the te form. So, first clause、uh, linked with the second clause. I don't think sequence really makes sense here. Like, it seems like they probably happened at the same time.、Um, I don't really see any causality linking these two things together. They're just two things that happened. And so, that's why the te form is used here. It's just two linked clauses because two separate things happened that are kind of, that kind of go together. And note again in this, this linking construction, the, because you use the te form, it doesn't denote、uh, tense. Or, or other facets of the verb. So that's all left for the final form of the verb. Only at the end do we learn that this took place in the past by, by virtue of this being the past tense. Whereas here, it didn't specify whether it was past or non past. The last thing here is you're probably wondering why is it the te eru form? Why couldn't this just be、uh, skurimashita? Why does it have to be te eru? What is the sense of it here? Is it saying, is it trying to emphasize that the action took place in the past and when it took place, it was an ongoing action? That's what the English past tense progressive conveys. Like, I was making. At the time in the past, it was an ongoing action of making. But again, literally, what the t e r u form is just saying, like, you, you do an action and then exist. Like, do and exist is the literal translation of the t e r u form. And, and so, in some cases, it, what it emphasizes is that an action took place and the result of that action persisted. And I think that's actually probably the sense of this here. It's saying that you made. Food in the past, and the result of that action persisted. So, why say that and why not just say, Why not just say, Well, I made in the past? Like, why do you have to emphasize that the result of that action persisted? In this case, I think it's really basically just a stylistic choice. Like, it's a subtle difference of emphasis and, and not really a distinction. It, there's no real actual hard distinction of meaning between and in this case. If, if I'm wrong, if people have other theories, I'd, I'd love to hear it, but、uh, that is my sense of it. Oh, and come to think of it, you may also be wondering why in these sentences, in this story, we're kind of randomly going back and forth between past tense, as here, past tense, past tense, but then here it's present tense, or I should say non past tense, non past tense, past tense, past tense, non past tense. Yeah, so what's going on? Well, if you think about it in English,、um, what happens is, okay, so imagine I'm telling a story. About something that happened in the past. And so, of course, you can narrate it entirely in the past tense. You can say, I went to the store, I saw this guy, he did this, he did that. That all makes sense, right? But people will also, in English, we will say, we, we'll narrate a story in the present tense, even though it happened in the past. I'll say, I go to the store, I see this guy, he does this, he does that, right? That's, that's something we can do. And people understand, well, you're talking, you, you, people understand from context that you're talking about the past. So, actually, what will happen then is that English speakers will. Kind of sloppily slide back and forth between past and present. They'll say, I went to the store, I see this guy, he does this, and then he did that. And it, yeah, so you'll, if you actually pay attention to how people narrate stories in English, they, they'll do the same thing. They'll just kind of sloppily go back and forth between past and present. So I think that's what's happening here. It's a story about the past, and yet for some sentences, she just sort of randomly decides to use the, the non past form. Okay, next sentence. おじいちゃんおばあちゃんも来るからたくさん作らなきゃいけなくて朝5時前に起きて作っていました。So this means、uh, grandfather, grandmother, they're marked by も and that makes it the topic 
but Mo has a sense of as well also in addition. So grandma and, and grandma, grandma and grandpa as well, they are the topic. And then come and kara after a, a clause has a sense of like because. So because come and then many make. And this form of make, well, it's a te form, it's a conjunctive form, but as we'll discuss in uh, more detail in a minute, this has a sense of like must make. It's a bit, must make many here. And so uh, morning, five o'clock, before five o'clock in the morning, and then um, wake up and make, or rather past tense, so made. Wake up and make before five o'clock in the morning. Okay, so when you mark a clause with kara, it has a sense of because. It makes the, it makes the clause explanatory. So because grandma and grandpa are coming, also coming, uh, we must make a lot. And so before five o'clock in the morning, we get up and make or made stuff. So one thing here is the time expression before five, five o'clock in the morning is marked by ni to make it explicitly an, an verbal expression. I'm not sure you, you need that. I think you could leave it out. And noun time expressions are generally just understood to be adverbs. They don't strictly require ni. So I think you could drop it in this case. Another small thing is here. Honestly, I don't really know why there's no ya or to between uh, grandpa and grandma. Perhaps this is sort of like a set phrase that's understood as being a, a unit, uh, like grandma and grandpa. Not sure about that. Uh, anyway, together they are the, the topic of this clause. And then another question is, why is this present tense? So we're past tense here, but then the explanation is, well, I shouldn't say present, I should say non-past tense. Well, like in English, when we use the present tense, we're often not really talking about something happening right now. We're talking about habitual action, right? So like grandma and grandpa, because grandma and grandpa also come, therefore we must make a lot. That makes sense if we're talking about an event that reoccurs. If it were a one-off event that happened in the past, it'd be kind of weird to use the present tense in that case. So so I think that's what's going on here. In this case, we're talking about a re reoccurring event. And so it makes it's okay, it makes sense to use non-past to, to, because the coming is habitual. It's something they do when this yearly event is held. So there are a number of ways in Japanese to express the idea of a verb being obligatory, something you have to do, that's something that must be done. So what we have here is actually confusingly a, a contracted form of tsukurono kereba. So that is the, the ba, meaning conditional form of the verb, that's also negative. So if not make, and no kereba has been contracted to no kya, or actually the way it's pronounced if you listen, it's she says no kyai, she like sloughs it into this initial e sound. Uh, and then what follows it, so this is iku in the potential negative te form, conjunctive form. So iku, the, just the potential form is ikeru, and then the potential negative is ike nai, and then make that the conjunctive te form, the nai becomes nokte, so ike nokte. That's how you say cannot go. So very literally, if not make, cannot go. And it's a way of expressing obligation or something that must be done. And the sense to be clear of, of cannot go here is not literal. It's not necessarily like physical traversal. It's about like something wouldn't do. I, I, that's the closest uh, English equivalent I can think of is like, well, if you did this, that wouldn't do is sort of what this construction is saying. And so here, let's listen to it again and listen closely. And you'll hear that the way she pronounces this nakhyai so this is saying again must make a lot and there's other ways you could express this idea but this is one way of doing it それで両親たちはできるだけ朝早く学校に行ってトラックの近くのいい場所にレジャーシート so, sorede first is uh, again like so or therefore, it's just sort of a way to lead into a statement. Then we have uh, parents explicitly pluralized, that's our topic. And then, well, the, okay, so the verb here is go, and the target of where we're going is um, school, and adverb expression here of early morning. And also there's another adverb here, uh, which is like 
as much as one can, as much as possible. So I think it's saying as, as early as possible in the morning, go to school. Uh, the next part, um, let's see. So truck near and good place. So this is all saying a good place that is near a truck is really what it's saying. The location where the thing exists and what is the thing that exists? It is, um, here it's a, a leisure sheet, literally meaning here, a, a, a picnic blanket. And this is another case where she's using apposition. She stated a noun phrase, leisure sheet, and then she stated it another way. She said picnic sheet, which means the same thing. There's something a little strange here where she's snuck in a disne here. Like, and normally you don't have formal forms of the copula or, or, or verbs, except at the very end of a sentence. And so you would expect to have the, the period at the end instead of a comma. Um, so this is the sort of thing you probably don't see in, in properly written Japanese. This is, of course, a transcript of something someone said. So sort of a tick of verbal speech, but I think by the standards of written Japanese, it's not something you would normally see. Uh, anyway, so the last part here, shito oite, so uh, the te form of oku meaning put. So we're putting a sheet, meaning like putting it down on the ground, I assume. And then uh, so uh, taking a spot or I should say here, this is actually past tense. So took a spot is what this is saying. So we put down a sheet and took a spot. And this is another case where the use of the teiru form is a little strange to English speakers' expectations because, uh, again, if the teiru form is, is really the equivalent of the English progressive tense, then this would mean like, uh, I was taking, we were taking a spot, like continuously doing the act of taking the spot, which is a strange idea and not something you would normally say. But I think there's another case where actually the sense of it is, well, we took the spot and the result of that action persisted. I'm not really sure if there's any real difference in this case, literally, in the literal meaning between tottemashita and torimashita. I think it's another case of just sort of like a, a very subtle sort of shift of emphasis. It's like emphasizing the, well, we did the thing and then it wasn't just a momentary action, like the result of it, we made use of it for some time, I suppose. I don't know, that's, that's the best I can come up with. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense to me.